So who's caring for her children? Maybe some older women who are in the enslaved quarter site? So these are the kinds of questions we wonder about Judah's life. But we have a few more clues from some other records. So if you tune in, I'll tell you more. So on April 2nd, 1836, at the age of 42, Judith actually dies. And I don't know, I find that really sad and profound. We only would know, we would know she died maybe from the Hype family records, but we, that would be all we would know. We're fortunate though, Anne Hype wrote a letter to a friend about the incident. So we have a little bit more information and this is a transcript. And um, we have a handwritten letter from Anne Height. And she says, during the last two weeks, my cook was dangerously ill with a complaint, one of great suffering, a violent pleurisy. And it's the first instance terminating in an inflammation of the heart, which was most distressing. So pleurisy is actually like pneumonia. It's an inflammation of the lining of your lungs. Mr. Rogers was talking about how hot the kitchen was, how smoky it would have been, constantly exposed to that wood smoke. You know, maybe for eight, 10, 12 hours, 14 hours a day. <clears throat> Could that have been a factor with Judah's death? Could it have been a factor that she had given birth to a child every other year from 1814 to 1836? You know, 20, 12 years, of 20 years of giving birth to children. Could that have weakened her system, um, the hard labor she did? Certainly back in those days, they didn't have the medication that we have today. So pleurisy is a distressing disease today, but it can be treatable and a person can recover from it. Of course, in those days, they didn't have those things. But it's interesting also to read about what Anne Height tells her friend about this death. She finally went under the disease on Saturday morning, leaving 12 children, the youngest only five weeks old. I deplore her loss to her younger children more than my own inconvenience, which is very considerable. But it is the will of him that cannot err, of course. It is wisest best. I shall endeavor to discharge the additional duties that devolve upon me to the best of my ability. So Anne is compassionate. She is worried about Judah's children. But we find it interesting that she uses the word younger. Did you hear that when I read that? Her younger children. These days, if a parent would pass away, we would be worried about all their children, wouldn't we? So that's curious to us. We don't know what she means by that. It might be something for you to think further about, too. Um, and then she also talks about how much, dis how much work this is going to create for her. And it is. In a plantation lifestyle, um, guests, a busy family, um, enslaved workers to manage. That is going to be hard for Anne. That's going to be a loss for Anne. So a lot of our guests, when they hear our story about Judah, want to know what happened to her children. So I can tell you a few things that we know from some of the other archival records. For example, we don't know what happened to her oldest son named Sam. He's not in the records at all. Had he grown up and been sold to someone else? It's very probable. Whereas Marcus um, is still here on the property after her death. Got a little bit fortunate with our archival records because Judah passes away in April. In uh, the fall of that year, Isaac Height, the, the owner here at Bell Grove, also dies. And when a wealthy person dies, they would document all of their possessions. So shoes, horses, wagons, 
and yes, enslaved people. They were property. And in fact, they were the most valuable property and listed first in an estate inventory. And I'll share with some, pic some pictures so you can see what that estate inventory would look like. And we know from that that Marcus was still here. He was the first son born on the plantation here. And he's 18 years old in the inventory and has a value of $1,000. We know that he was given to Isaac Height's youngest son, Cornelius, but Cornelius himself dies as a young man. So then what happened to Marcus? He was sold at the age of 24 for only the value of $600. And we don't know what happened to him after that. Where would he have gone after that? He was living in Virginia. Was he sold to the deeper south? where the cotton was booming, we don't know. But we also heard about the five-week-old son, and that's a sad ending as well. His name was Jonathan, and he was born on February 28, 1836. Later on in the year, he's not listed in the inventory, and we wonder if he died. Perhaps while his mother was pregnant with him, if she had a a lung ailment, it could have impaired his development. Perhaps he, he passed away. Because other young children that um, were, the, were the children of Judah are still in this list, and Jonathan is not. So that whole you know explanation was amazing. And you know one of the things that I want you all to think about is record keeping, right? One of the things that we don't often think about, especially when it comes to documents and historical documents. I mean, you know, we have eighty thousand copies, you know, of the Declaration of Independence, right? We have all these copies of Common Sense, but when it comes to these records, and when we talk about these slave records, and we talk about, you know, having record of when a child was born. When a child dies, you know, who's here on the property, who's not, that is all based on people and their record keeping. And, you know, in some cases, in some of these families, especially here in the Valley, those records are not complete. And so one of the things that we have to really think about, especially as we move upstairs, is how important is it that this family is remembered, right? How important is it that Judah's story is told? Right. And what does that story look like compared to the family upstairs? Right. What does the family have on record versus what does Judah have on record? Right. These are all the big questions that I want you all to think about, especially as we move upstairs. So we have an area on the property here that we call the Insight Burial Ground. And it doesn't have headstones, uh, just field stones, which is typical. Um, and so it's a place for us to think about those like Judah, those like Jonathan, who passed away. Um, they gave basically their life to working here. Um, and it's a great place of memory. So what do you think, you know, Judah's legacy was then? She worked her whole life here. There's a Virginia law saying the status of the mother is the status of the children. So her children were enslaved as she was. And she had no real hope of ever knowing that they would see freedom. When she died in, in 1836, freedom was still a long way off. So what do you think her legacy might have been? How do you think her legacy compares to the Hyde family? So we're going to take you upstairs next. If you tune into the next video, we'll tell you a little bit more. Thanks.